This video will be a brief description of mechanism. We will take a look at three different mechanisms that are discussed in Chapter 6. We will have a look at hydrohalogenation, hydration, and solvation. Before we jump to drawing mechanisms, it is important to first review some terminology. We will be using the terms electrophile and nucleophile quite frequently. An electrophile is a species that is electron deficient, so it loves to gain electrons. A nucleophile, on the other hand, is an electron-rich species, so it loves to share its electrons. Given these two definitions, we can see that nucleophiles will react with electrophiles. We can also think about the second rule of organic chemistry to put this in context. So what is a mechanism anyway? A mechanism provides a detailed description of a reaction. Essential to this description is the movement of electrons. A mechanism shows the movement of electrons with curved arrows, which will be discussed shortly. Additionally, a mechanism shows which bonds are broken and which bonds are formed. Typically, the bond breaking step is the rate determining step, which can abbre be abbreviated as RDS. We will look at the mechanism shown on this slide in detail. There are rules for drawing an adequate mechanism, just like there are rules for naming organic compounds. It is important that the appropriate arrows are used in order to convey the information to another person. Notice that we have arrows for reactions, equilibrium, resonance, retrosynthetic analysis, and movement of electrons. Let's look at the arrows that involve the movement of electrons. Be sure to differentiate between the arrow that moves a pair of electrons in the arrow that moves a single electron. Electrophilic addition reactions are the characteristic reaction of alkenes. You will notice a general pattern in the mechanisms for these reactions. The first step of this reaction is the addition of the electrophile. Let's have a look at the following example to see how this works. Since we are adding HCl, this is a hydrohalogenation reaction. Let's identify the nucleophile and the electrophile in this example. Recall that a nucleophile is an electron-rich species. Which species is electron-rich? The alkene is electron-rich due to its double bond. Which species is electron-deficient? Hydrogen is electron-poor, so it is the electrophile. Keeping the second rule of organic chemistry in mind, we can draw a curved arrow to show the movement of a pair of electrons. The electrons from the nucleophile move to the electrophile, which causes the bond in HCl to break. The pi bond breaks, and the electrophile adds. What product does this give us? Well, the first step involves the addition of the electrophile, so the hydrogen will add, and we will get a carbocation. Also note that we get a chloride ion, which is important for the next step of the reaction. Looking at these products, we can consult the first rule of organic chemistry, that is, opposites attract. So the chlor chloride ion will form a bond with the positively charged carbon. Now let us put this product all the way together. The product of this reaction is 3-chlorohexane. You might have noticed that the previous example was a symmetrical alkene. What happens when there is an asymmetrical alkene? For these, we consult Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule basically says that the product we will get from this reaction is the more substituted haloalkane. The textbook has a nice description of this, and the author presents it as this. The electrophile adds preferentially to the sp2 carbon bonded to the most hydrogens. We can remember this as less E, more nu, meaning that the less substituted carbon will get the electrophile and the more substituted carbon will get the nucleophile. Let's look at this example and first identify which carbon is more substituted. The sp2 carbon on the left has a methyl group and a hydrogen attached to it, while the sp2 carbon on the right has two hydrogens attached to it. Therefore, the sp2 carbon on the left is more substituted. 
This means that the other carbon is less substituted. Looking at the products, why is the major product the major product? When we look at the mechanism, it depends on carbocation stability. The major product here gives a secondary carbocation, while the minor product gives a primary carbocation. Recall that a secondary carbocation is more stable than a primary carbocation, hence why we get the major product. The first reaction we will look at is hydration of an alkene, which is the addition of water. Because this reaction shows we need an acid catalyst, such as sulfuric acid, for the reaction to proceed. Note that this reaction follows Markovnikov's rule. So how does this reaction happen? Anytime we ask how a reaction happens, or why it happens, we think about the mechanism. Let us now begin the mechanism. Notice that the alkene is reacting with H3O+, which is obtained from the reaction between water and sulfuric acid. Consulting the second rule of organic chemistry, electrons go from where they is, in this case the double bond, to where they ain't. This causes the bond between the hydrogen and oxygen to break, leaving a lone pair on the oxygen. Now what does this give us? The electrophile is going to add to the less substituted carbon, and we will get a carbocation. The next step of this reaction involves the action of water. Since we are reacting this alkene with water, there is plenty of water around. Now we think back to the first rule of organic chemistry, opposites attract. There is a partial negative charge on the oxygen and a, par and a positive charge from the carbocation, so we will get movement of electrons. When this bond forms, everything attached to the oxygen will come along for the ride, so the two hydrogens will remain attached to the oxygen, and there will be a positive formal charge on the oxygen atom. Again, since we are reacting with water, we have plenty of it around. How can we get rid of the formal charge on the oxygen atom? Well, water can act as a base and abstract the proton. Doing this causes the hydrogen-oxygen bond to break, meaning that the oxygen gets a lone pair of electrons, which will remove the positive charge. Our final product is now obtained. Notice that H3O+, the acid catalyst, is regenerated. The next reaction we will look at is solvation, which is the addition of an alcohol to an alkene. Notice by the reaction shown here that this requires an acid catalyst, just like in hydration. Also similar to the hydration reaction, this reaction follows Markovnikov's rule. How does this solvation reaction happen? The answer? Mechanism. For this example, we will see how the alcohol reacts with sulfuric acid first, and then we will go into the mechanism for the addition to the alkene. Just like we have been doing, the electrons from the nucleophile will grab the electrophile, which causes the hydrogen-oxygen bond to break as well. Then, we get our products, which consists of a protonated alcohol and the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. The protonated alcohol will react with the alkene since it is electrophilic. Now onto the mechanism for the solvation to an alkene. As we have seen with, other, with the other mechanisms with alkenes, the pi bond is going to break, and the electrons that reside in the hydrogen-oxygen bond will be left on the oxygen as a lone pair. This will remove the formal charge on the oxygen. Now what does this give us? We get a carbocation intermediate. Remember Markovnikov's rule, less the more new, so the electrophile, in this case hydrogen, will add to the less substituted carbon. Also, since methanol is our solvent, there is plenty of it around. We can think back to the first rule of opposites attract to predict what will happen next. One of the lone pairs of the, on the oxygen will be attracted to the positively charged carbon. Again, when this bond forms, everything attached to the oxygen will come along for the ride. We have plenty of methanol around since it is our solvent. 
So what happens next? We need to remove the formal charge that's on the oxygen. Methanol can act as a base to pull off the proton connected to the oxygen, which causes the hydrogen-oxygen bond to break. Now we get the final product, 2-methoxypropane. I was also note that our catalyst, the protonated alcohol, is regenerated. Carbocations can rearrange if a more stable carbocation can be formed. Recall that a tertiary carbocation is the most stable, while a methyl carbocation is the least stable. One way this can happen is through a 1-2 hydride shift. This is the movement of a hydrogen atom. When we look at this reaction here, we can see that the expected Markovnikov product is the minor product, and another product is the major product. How does this happen? We turn to the mechanism to answer this question. First, the pi bond is going to break, causing the HCl bond to break. The electrophile will add, and we will get a carbocation intermediate. Let's classify this carbocation. Since it is connected to two other, carbo two other carbons, this is a secondary carbocation. This carbocation will rearrange if it can become more stable. In this case, we need a tertiary carbocation, and we can achieve that by moving a hydrogen. Moving this hydrogen gives us another carbocation intermediate, Let's now classify this carbocation. It is connected to three carbons, so it is a tertiary carbocation, which is more stable than a secondary carbocation. Also note that chloride is present from the first step of this reaction. We know the opposites attract, so the chloride ion will be attracted to the carbocation, and we will get our final product. This is how we get the major product of this reaction. Another way carbocation rearrangement can occur is through a 1,2 methyl shift. This is where the movement of a methyl group occurs. The mechanism is similar to the 1,2 hydride shift, but here we are now moving a methyl group instead of a hydrogen atom.